I've given this talk twice before to two separate, to two different audiences, two very different audiences. And now I'd like, I'd just like to try it out again, but this time try it out for a, a general audience. I mean, people who are interested uh, of any background whatsoever. And what I ask of you, the listeners and watchers, is, 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 an, is an open mind, an open mind to uh, the possibility that the young lady on the right might perhaps even be innocent. Uh, certainly, I hope you're open to the possibility that her trial was not completely fair. And I hope you're open to the possibility that the pre preceding police investigation was uh, not uh, completely uh, fair or unbiased either. Okay, now, um, what do I have to say here? Let uh, the in, in, I'm a statistician. I'm a scientist. I'm a statistician. I certainly have opinions <laughs> about Lucy Letby's uh, innocence. I, I, I see no reason whatsoever to suppose she killed anybody, actually. And I, I have reasons for thinking that. That's what I think. Uh, I, I try to, to talk about... Uh, I try to separate my personal opinion from science. The science based on what I know and I know uh, uh, a lot of things which I certainly think the, the jury didn't know. And uh, anybody can look at these things on the internet nowadays. Of course, uh, we don't know how reliable everything is. You <laughs> Obviously, you mustn't believe everything you find on the internet. Uh, I, I do think there is enough uh, evidence out there which was not shown to the jurors, uh, certainly not shown to the public during the trial, but which certainly should have been. And uh, I hope there will be a retrial and that this evidence will be properly validated and, and used. Now, um, I am interested in the Lu Lucy Letby case because I was previously very much involved in the case of the young lady on the left. Uh, and on the, so let me start off by talking about Lucia de Berg in the Netherlands. And there's, you see a, a photograph of her here from uh, uh, like the good days before she became a suspect in the murder investigation and before she became convicted and was widely known to be the most uh, horrible serial killer, both of, of uh, serial killer nurse, both of uh, young babies in a children's hospital and of old, older people, older, sick, aged people in uh, other hospitals where she'd worked earlier. Uh, you see her here in uh, 1993, probably, photograph taken by a friend, probably at Christmas time. I, I know the friend, I know Lucia. And at this time she was, uh, I'm not sure if she already was a nurse. She's, her age here is about 30. She has a already has a husband and, and a daughter and her friend Carol Edrich. Actually, she had been a cleaning lady for Carol Edrich and Carol Edrich had encouraged her to become a nurse and, and so she did. Well, um, her, Lucia's trials and tribulations began in 2001. Uh, a baby died unexpectedly. Uh, the baby's name is Amber. So that, that's like the baby A of the Lucy Lucia de Berg case, and um, that was in September 2001, just after 9-11, I think. And uh, some people thought that that death was surprising and, un and unexpected, and some people at the hospital, I mean. Uh, some others at the hospital were not surprised at all, actually. We, we now know, of course. But um, uh, this event certainly uh, c combined with suspicions which some uh, doctors at the hospital previously had about Lucia de, de Berg. And, uh, and by the way, there was also a lot of gossip about her at the hospital because she certainly had had a very colorful life up till then. And I'm not going to go into the details now, but uh, there were lots of uh, weird things talk, to, talked about her. And she was one of those nurses who stands out in the crowd and uh, says when she thinks things are going and not being done right. Uh, and uh, okay, she didn't let herself be walked over by anybody. And okay, so 
people, some people found her very odd. And I was, uh, some people found her a bit scary. Many uh, loved her very much or liked her very much at least. Uh, anyway, so her, uh, Lucia's trials and tribulations began in 2001 uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the death of baby Amber reported to the police. And in no time, though, so there was a police investigation. And of course, immediately Lucia was like the key suspect. And she was arrested in uh, December 2001. There was a first uh, trial in 2003. And at that trial, the main evidence against her was statistical evidence. And of course, it's the, the statistical evidence which is, uh, well, <laughs> it's my field, of course, but which uh, interests me and and it's the it's statistical evidence which I also see linking these two cases uh, even though as you well know probably in the Lucy Letby case there was no statistical evidence used well there was a spreadsheet with some uh, numbers on it but uh, uh, both uh, defense uh, sorry both prosecution and defense you know in the Lucy Letby case did not as far as we know, employ a statistician or an epidemiologist and did not uh, talk about statistical data and, and statistical uh, analysis. Uh, okay, now in the Lucy Letby case, sorry, in the Lucy at the Berg case, the one on the left, lady on the left, um, it, it, at her initial trial, which resulted in her conviction, by the way, for a number of murders and, and attacks, um, the main piece of evidence was a calculation of a probability, and the probability was one in 342 million, if I remember correctly, and it was actually calculated by, by a friend of mine who I also respected uh, very much. Uh, 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 and um, at, at that time, uh, like uh, we, the public, but also professionals, didn't know exactly what he'd done, but we... Uh, I knew he was a decent person and, and a competent person, and he got this number, one in 342 million. Now, uh, many people misunderstood it. it. It was not the chance that she was innocent. No, it was, the ch it was supposed to be the chance that were she innocent and were the coincidences between her shifts and bad things happening completely due to chance, what was then the chance of such an uh, such an extreme uh, uh, coincidence or correlation or association? So it it, it was that one in three hundred forty two million was not the probability she was innocent, but it was the probability that were she innocent and was any everything just due to chance, then the probability that there would have been such an extreme uh, association between her presence and the deaths. Okay, and that same expert said, uh, well, okay, so obviously my hypotheses are wrong because we don't believe that a one in 342 million event happened. So there is some uh, meaning behind it. This is a, a correlation and it's real and there must be some something causing it. And he gave a whole list of possible causes. And of course, only one of them, only one of them, was that Luce, Lucia was murdering people. Obviously that would have been an explanation, but he pointed out other explanations. And actually at, in, during the trial, uh, the uh, judges, it, uh, I should mention straight away that one of the big differences, of course, in these two cases is that the Netherlands case is done according to Netherlands uh, criminal prosecution law and uh, we do not have a jury. We, we don't trust a bunch of average people off the streets to decide uh, guilt or innocence. Uh, we prefer to have a, 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 a judge's bench of uh, three, you know, professional judges that have been to university, studied law, very experienced. We prefer an, uh, what, what you could think of as an inquiry run by a board of judges a little group of three judges, a, a chairman and two people there checking that what he says is correct or she. Uh, and uh, we, we like it that way much better. And these are the, this is due to differences in culture and history, 
which are sort of not important, but it, it, it's a big difference. Uh, and I will mention a big difference, I think, straight away, uh, and between a jury trial, as one has in the UK, and an inquiry or so-called inquisitorial, uh, this is uh, inquisitorial versus inquisitorial ver versus adversarial, the other technical names for these two kinds of trials. In inquisitorial trial, as we have in the Netherlands, the judges actually, uh, uh, um, okay, so they, they run an inquiry. They are free to call scientists and witnesses and experts, and they can uh, change things on the way as they go along, by the way. They don't have to, but, but many things are, are agreed beforehand. Just like in England, there are also pre-trial uh, meetings with, with uh, uh, judges and barristers, the equivalent of barristers, and uh, 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 scientific, scientific experts have uh, are of a very different category from ordinary witnesses uh, and treated in a, in a different way. So that these these are those are similarities. Now to get back to a rather important difference, at the end of the day, the judges give their verdict, and they also have to write up their motivation for their verdict, and it is published. But they have to give their reasoning. They have to say what was the evidence which convinced them and why, and if they use some kind of logical deduction in there uh, to get to their conclusion, which they certainly did, then they, then they have to explain it. Now, this is uh, uh, an advantage of, for the defense, uh, of uh, the Netherlands system because it means that you can see what the reasoning was and if you can see a gap in the reasoning you can attack you can attack it obviously and use it in an appeal uh, and if you see evidence being used and being crucial and you disagree with that evidence or for instance, scientific evidence, which you think has been interpreted wrongly, you can point to that. It's, um, it makes the, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, such trials are fairer than the English ones in cases like this, which are so complex and with so much evidence and where uh, really a lot of thinking has to be done, very careful thinking in order to come to a reasonable decision. Uh, okay, so the uh, initial prosecution, sorry, the initial conviction of Lucie de Beck at the, at the, like the lower court, uh, where she got a life sentence, um, was almost entirely based on the statistical calculation. And immediately that was very controversial. And lots of people wrote letters to the newspapers saying, you can't do that, uh, you, you can't convict somebody just on the basis of a probability calculation, a theoretical probability calculation. This is just not, uh, this, this is not right. Also, statisticians started fighting each other because there are different kinds of statistics or statisticians. And so they started quarreling and, and, and in public, as <laughs> statisticians do, and uh, arguing that um, uh, the wrong statistical paradigm was used and it should be Bayesian rather than frequentist or vice versa, okay? And that was an interesting discussion. And it certainly meant that the, uh, the, there was an appeal and there was a new trial and that was quite rapid. It was a year later. And again, Lucia was convicted and this time actually of more of more murders and more murderous attacks. And the judges wrote explicitly the beginning of their like 150 page <laughs> motivation because it was a complex case. So they, uh, they, they wrote out exactly why, exactly why they were so convinced that she was such an evil person and how they came to that conclusion, their logical reasoning and the evidence which convinced them. It was all written out in 150 or so pages the longest, uh, longest summary, <laughs> uh, uh, we call it an arrest in the Netherlands, I don't know why, but it's the longest one in Dutch legal history. Uh, and the, on the first page, the judges are very, very explicit. We do not use a statistical, or the court makes no use at all 
of a statistical probability calculation. They, they say it right up front, this is not statistics. We're not using any statistics. No statistician has calculated a probability for us. They're not interested in that. Uh, it goes on to say, uh, Lucia is, has been convicted, is convicted by us on, on the basis of irrefutable scientific uh, medical evidence. Okay, that's very clear. Now, that's a kind of stops all discussion in the press and in the public among, uh, in, in then nascent social media about the statistics in this case, because it was just medicine and it was definitive and proven. And uh, not many people wrote, read those 150 pages. That was in 2004. So that was like three years after the uh, whole thing started. Um, the uh, uh, defense uh, made one more attempt going to the Supreme Court because some evidence had got forgotten. It had stayed in some drawer at a forensic institute and it was uh, said to be the exculpatory and should have been used in the trial, but it arrived one day too late or something. Okay, this kind of thing. Uh, but the Supreme Court turned down that application. And um, uh, actually they did do one thing. Uh, Lucia had got a life sentence, but in the Netherlands, a life sentence is only 30 years. And even if you're a good behaving prisoner, you could come out earlier. Um, the judges were so absolutely convinced of, of Lucia's guilt and of her evil character that they tacked on to that life sentence uh, indefinite indefinite uh, incarceration in a, in a closed psychiatric hospital after the sentence had been set out. So the idea was indeed that it, it, well, it became a, a full life sentence, you can say. Okay, 30 years in jail and then the rest of your life in a psychiatric prison, locked up. Um, amusingly, that, that was the 2004 verdict uh, uh, and uh, um, sentence. The Supreme Court removed that addition of the psychiatric bit because, as they pointed out, a psychiatric investigation had been done into Lucia de Berg's uh, state of mind. And uh, of course, it uh, uncovered several uh, sort of disorders, like, uh, you know, everybody is weird in one way or another, and all these weirdnesses have got labels and names. And pharmaceutical companies have med medicines to, uh, <laughs> to sell to you for them, to sell to your doctors. Uh, but there was no psychiatric issue which she had, which could be associated with her crimes. So therefore, she could not be sent to a psychiatric hospital because there was no treatment she could receive. Quite stunning. That was 2005. So uh, her life sentence got reduced to a plain life sentence at that stage. Now, that was exactly the time when a couple of whistleblowers started getting active. And these were a philosopher of science, professor, or just retired professor, uh, and a medical doctor, senior medical doctor, uh, brother and sister. They had uh, personal connections to people at the hospital where Lucia had worked, so they had some inside uh, knowledge, so they were careful not to use it. And uh, uh, they started talking to journalists and generally stirring things up. And uh, an, an application was made to the... Um, the Dutch equivalent of the CCRC, Criminal, Close, uh, Criminal Cases Review Commission, in the UK. We have one in the Netherlands. The Netherlands equivalent was started at the same time as the UK one, and for exactly the same reason as a result of enormous scandals about miscarriages of justice involving either uh, police um, uh, tunnel vision, let's say, or uh, involving use of wrong experts who weren't actually experts uh, or of uh, misinterpretation of scientific evidence. So exactly the same things as in the UK. Um, and that, that team also published a book and the book was in the book, bookstores. 
And uh, I mean, the case was completely closed. <laughs> there was no, uh, no, no contempt of court involved in this. And anyway, our contempt of court rules are rather more reasonable, I would say, than the British ones. Uh, anyway, they started stirring. A couple of people started stirring things up. And a long, long, long process started, which eventually only by, in 2010. So that, it took five years. It took five years. And we thought it was such and such a long time. It took five years to stir things up enough and to uh, get things working and to get the wheels in motion such that there was at last a new trial started in 2009, I suppose. And um, uh, uh, Lucia de Beck walked free in 2010 and because there was a new trial and it was a fair trial and new evidence was there, or at least new interpretations of scientific evidence was there, which were much more plausible, and one thing and another. And moreover, the public was also convinced by then, and everybody now knows that Lucia was completely innocent, I would say. I mean, there may be some odd people who still say, well, she may have murdered some people. Well, I maybe, I mean, maybe I'm the emperor of China. I mean, yes, it's possible, of course but it's totally implausible if you know a bit about the whole thing. Um, so uh, actually 2005 is when I got involved and I should just say why it was because a friend of mine uh, got very involved, a statistician. He got very upset because he also found, he got very upset by the fact that he discovered that though the judges had said there was no statistics anymore, the statistical thinking still reverberated through all those 150 pages of summary of the verdict, I mean, of the deductions of the judges of the inquiry. And um, indeed, for instance, there were doctors who actually said explicitly that, like, normally I would have thought that this case was uh, perfectly natural, but since Lucia was there and since she was there so often and can't explain it, you know, and uh, uh, I'm inclined to, to believe that this case is is uh, this particular death was was unnatural, right? So that that um, irrefutable scientific medical evidence was actually a, an opinion by and it was based in part on some opinions of medical doctors whose opinions were contaminated by the fact that they knew that a nurse was being investigated for a crime and that she was always there when things happened. Because, I mean, that was just a fact. I mean, that was true. She was, um, she was surprised. Uh, it was a bit unusual. I have a probability calculation coming out at one in 50. So, okay, she, I would say that's bad luck. That's very bad luck. It's maybe even grounds for investigating. But if, and anyway, let's, uh, I think it's time to, to move on because I said enough about Lucia now and uh, I will talk about more parallels and differences between these uh, two cases uh, later on. And how long have I been on my first slide? <laughs> 25 minutes. <laughs> this is how it always goes. Right. I will try to do a number of slides more rapidly now. Okay, slide two <laughs> of about 24. Of 24, in fact. Uh, many of them I would skip over pretty fast, if not entirely. Now, uh, slide two shows uh, what uh, what certainly uh, is, you can say, is statistical data. Uh, it's data of the uh, uh, showing the numbers of of neonatal neonatal deaths on uh, Lucy's ward, Lucy Lepis, in ICU. Uh, neonatal intensive care unit, NICU. And um, as you see, in 2015, there were nine. And in 2016, there were eight. And 2015 is the year that Lucy was, for the first time, fully qualified. And in, indeed, she was like the most qualified nurse on that ward. So she had uh, 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 yeah, the highest responsibility among the nurses. And she started working in that capacity 
she'd been she'd worked on the ward bit earlier while in uh, train while training uh, she studied at Chester she lived close by uh, she was in the hospital a very great deal in early years as well as from 2015 from January 2015 and um, she was taken off the ward uh, mid 2016. I'm not quite sure exactly when, but let's say it was. The f she was working on the ward the first six months. So those those that the, that peak of large numbers is very close to the time when she was most heavily responsible for nursing duties on that ward. Okay, so that's a correlation you could say. Does it mean causation? Now. Uh, there's something uh, everybody should realize straight away that raw numbers are not the only thing here. I mean, these raw, these num numbers uh, say something. Yes, they're numbers. They, this, these are statistics. Uh, they say that it looks as though something perhaps changed or was different in those two years. I mean, possibly things were different after those two years and possibly things were different before those two years. But more important, most important thing that can be different over all those six years are, uh, are two, two things. The number of babies on the ward, like the number of admittances. No, not the number of admittances, because mothers are admitted and they give birth and then you have babies and you many times there are two or three. So uh, let's say the number of, uh, number of infants on the ward or admitted into the ward so uh, it, I mean it could just have been that there were twice as many babies on the ward in those two years right then then this would not be surprising at all now actually that turns out not to be the case uh, if you correct for the total uh, the, the volume <laughs> volume of care being given on the ward it, it, it it's still interesting um, though still it, uh, by the way if you do a statistical calculation that could just be chance uh, any statistician can uh, quickly write a little R script uh, and, and simulate uh, a sequence of six observations from a Poisson 4 distribution, and you will get all kinds of results, and some of them will look like this very easily. And I will give you some more reasons why one would even expect uh, things like that by chance. So it this could have been complete chance, okay, but perhaps it wasn't. So it certainly is an indication that one should think more and investigate more. Now, not just the volume of babies coming into the ward, right, from the maternity ward where they're born, in, transferred into the neonatal ward, where hopefully many of them only stay a short time and and uh, uh, go home uh, okay but some are going to die if, especially if there are very serious uh, cases so what also could be different in those two years is is what some people call the acuity acuity the seriousness the heaviness uh, the complexity of those cases uh, and, and a very important f uh, factor there is how many of these cases are twins and and triplets how many of them are members of multiple births? If that goes up, you can expect more trouble, right? Uh, how many of them uh, are, 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 are premature? How many of them are severely premature? Now, we, we know that in uh, June 2016, uh, the level of the ward was, was decreased from a level two to a level one, uh, and that uh, there were uh, no longer such severe cases being admitted to the ward. They were they were going elsewhere. I mean, they were born in the maternity department, perhaps. Though actually, mothers with uh, high risk would not even be coming to the maternity ward either. Uh, we also know that because of worries about the hospital, the, the number of patients uh, dropped. Anyway, um, uh, anyway, the the difference from 2015 2016 to thereafter is not is, is not interesting at all because it's like a different ward altogether now actually uh, recently evidence has come to light showing that in um, 2014 and maybe 2013 around that time um, due to 
various issues in North Wales. Uh, North Wales neonatal units were being downgraded and more babies were being transferred across the border to, and their mothers, uh, you know, before birth, were being uh, sent to neighbouring hospitals across the, the border. And there are two hospitals, I believe, in Liverpool and there's Chester. And they, they were picking up difficult cases coming from North Wales. I have no idea how many uh, uh, these are things which need to be investigated. Uh, I think there is a, a good reason to suppose that the case mix in 2013 and 2014 and certainly in preceding years was not the same as the case mix in uh, 2015 and 2016. So this could mean nothing at all. Now, actually, while this number is here, I, uh, these numbers are here, I want to <laughs> remark another important thing. Um, re remember the whole case of Lucy Letby turns around uh, deaths and collapses of uh, very young babies. And you would think that, that death is, is something <laughs> which has a firm definition. I mean, you, you, times of death are known, aren't they, right? That somebody died, a small baby died, is known, isn't it? But take a look at the stillbirths. And did you know that in the first six days after birth, if a baby dies in the first six days, its death need not be registered as a death. It may be registered as a stillbirth. Uh, this has, um, there are reasons why parents would like this. Like if they've been told and they believe that their baby was going to die anyway, uh, they might prefer it to be thought of as a stillbirth. They might not like the idea of a post-mortem because if it's a death, there has to be a post-mortem. Well, I won't say what one could think about doctors and post-mortems and what they think about that. Uh, though I will say straight away that the doctors were, were um, criticized strongly by the uh, Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health investigation in the uh, um, second half of, well, it started in 2016, I think, and uh, was a, a version of their report was published early 2017, but a longer report was available to relevant authorities in uh, 2016, end of 2016, yeah, mid 2016, and it actually led uh, precipitated the uh, the lowering of the level of the Countess of Chester Hospital. So, um, yeah, what did I want to say? Okay, stillbirths or deaths? Uh, actually, that's not hard and fast. That that there are definitions. I mean, uh, the definition of a stillbirth in in according to the NHS, it it has some. It's it, it has it's of it's uh, has some formal and also legal definition. Of course, these are uh, legal categories. Well, I mean, death is a legal category, but some of those stillbirths were actually live births which died. Uh, and uh, you should also look at the numbers of stillbirths and late fetal losses. And for instance, in 2017, that's a big number, 11 stillbirths, right? Lucy is not there anymore. Lucy is not there anymore. It's a police investigation going on. Uh, the number of stillbirths in, in uh, 2015 is, is, is big. Uh, of course, some of those uh, stillbirths are, are perhaps uh, connected or labeled as events for which Lucy was accused of causing them. I'm not sure, I don't know. There's a whole lot of things to be investigated there. Look at those numbers in 2013 and 2014. Okay. Those are pretty big, I think. Okay. Uh, so what is uh, really notable about the Lucy Levy case is that no statistician was employed by police or by prosecution or by the defense, as far as we know. I mean, we know one was, at least one was consulted by the defense, but their evidence was not 
used. They were not brought in as an uh, expert. Um, very strange, very strange. Sure, they had very interesting things to say. Okay, but let's not get into conspiracies here. Um, okay, so, uh, but uh, as I also said, in the Lucia de Baer case from 2003 at the higher court, there was no statistics anymore. There was no statistician anymore. And, uh, but still, as I've said, uh, the statistics themselves, the numbers, which in the Lucia de Baer case, obviously could not have been a coincidence. Even Lucia thought she was spooked. Uh, those numbers did play a role. Yet no professional numbers person uh, explained to them why, explained to the court, either of Lucy or of Lucia, uh, why those numbers maybe say less than appears. As And I will come to a couple of those issues in a moment, I guess. Now, um, uh, I, most people know something about the Lucy Letby case nowadays, and many people know that there are three items of evidence which seem to convince a lot of people. And the first one has certainly got something to do with statistics. Um, but of course, we don't know what convinced the jurors, and they, we don't have to, and we won't, and we shouldn't. Uh, we, do, we do know what the prosecution thought was important, and uh, the, the judge also uh, pointed out these things in, in uh, uh, his uh, concluding remarks and instructions to the jurors to, what to think about various things, uh, about which a lot of criticism can be had. Uh, one thing is absolutely clear, the police thought this was incredibly significant. Now, what does this table show? It shows that Lucy was there at every event at which she's accused of doing something bad. Right. Well, okay, top marks for police. They don't have any, they don't have any, <laughs> they don't, in, they, they're not accusing her of doing crimes when she wasn't there. Very smart, I would say. The, the thing is, Suppose you would pick any hospital and you would pick any nurse and you would pick the events at which she was present, or he for that matter, and you, you would uh, then look at what other nurses were present at those events. Now, the chances are just overwhelming that you would see something exactly like this. This table says nothing. Of course, Lucy was there every time when she was convicted well, sorry, when she was accused of a crime, not convicted, by the way. She wasn't convicted of most of these, of many of these events, of causing many of these events. These are events, by the way, not children. Number of the children, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I missed a mistake. This child I, child I, child I, child I, there are four children repeated there, and there, child J, child J. Sorry, these are, these are the children. I, I sometimes uh, look at A, B, C, D, E, F, G and think they're just the events. Um, okay, I have to take that back. I, I make mistakes too. Now, um, this table does says nothing. Uh, it, it gives us insight into police <laughs> reasoning. Now, uh, it uh, one, um, okay, the footnote which the police put there is X indicates on duty presence on the shift where a suspicious event has been identified. Okay, so the police think that those 25 events are suspicious, and we should try to find out why they think they are suspicious. If they think they are suspicious because they think Lucy Letby is a suspicious person and they collected 25 events where she was present then this is uh, garbage, right? And the Lucia de Ver case was much like that, actually. Of course, if there's hard evidence on those 25 cases that those events really are suspicious, so we have to know what is the definition of a suspicious event uh, and how it was, how it was ascertained. And okay, that, that is a very horrifying 
when you find out, and I will come back to that in a moment. But okay, so Lucy was there when she was accused of doing things, bad things, and other nurses are not there so often. Exactly as uh, should surprise nobody. So this 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 uh, graphic. I mean, it's a it's a picture, right? It's uh, it is a, it is a statistic. It's a summary of statistical data, and it is a misleading summary of statistical data. This is in the category of lies, damned lies, and statistics. This is an extraordinarily lying statistic, which should not have been featured strongly in the trial at all. Uh, the judge allowed uh, the prosecution to give this document uh, to the to the media. I think that was a terrible mistake. I think he was a fool. Sorry. I won't say that too many more times, but I do. I do. But of course, these cases are so, so difficult. And a judge is a lawyer, and they have a strange way of thinking about things. I will come back to that too. Right. So this is, okay, this is thought to be one of the smoking guns, but it isn't at all. It is only a smoking gun if you are convinced that the crosses in Lucy Letby's column uh, not only are suspicious, but are events where very, very bad things happened. And that Lucy, and that there's proof that Lucy did them. If, if you can prove that Lucy actually uh, committed a number of crimes in that column, if you could prove it, if you knew it for certain, then this table says something, as I will come back to later. But, uh, okay, uh, let's uh, just say uh, the defense says that every single one of those events was natural. Uh, in some sense, I mean, many of them are probably connected to uh, bad uh, medical care, especially on the part of the medical consultants who featured so strongly in the whole story and in the trial. Good, good. Well, here's the uh, the so-called uh, confession. Some people say this is a confession. Uh, some people just say it's a post-it note. I, I understand we don't even know if it's a post-it note, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This also was in all the newspapers. This, the prosecution, the prosecution thinks that this is damning. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, this is forensic data. I mean, this is a piece of evidence. And every piece of evidence should be considered from both points of view. The, the, the uh, innocent point of view and the um, uh, guilty point of view. Now, I think that if you think that Lucy is an evil killer, uh, that it is highly unlikely that she would keep this in a box under her bed when she knew the police was about to come. Now, of course, maybe she wanted to be arrested and burned to the stake. I mean, you know, but I, I, my uh, psychological instincts don't, don't buy that story at all. Um, on the other hand, if I think of a person who's been subjected to persecution for years, by a bunch of doctors, which I think is very clear, did go on. And there was police investigations threatened and she was being put off the ward and she felt that she should not be put off the ward and she was fighting that. She was involved in a big struggle with, with administration um, uh, uh, and everything was against her. She rightly felt, I would say, if she was innocent, which I think she is, but that's irrelevant. But if you imagine she would be innocent, then I think this is completely, this fits exactly. And of course, it has been uh, uh, decoded. Uh, people have attempted to to figure out what was saying, what she was saying. And a, a couple of graphologists have done professional analysis. I'm, I'm not going to say what I think about graphologists. Uh, scientists actually, but uh, that's certainly very intelligent and skilled and experienced people uh, with a reputation in this field have uh, decoded the post-it note. And uh, also amateurs have done it and I have done it. And I think all these decodings look very, very similar and they all make a very great deal of sense under the hypothesis of innocence. Whereas, as I said before, under the hypothesis of guilt, I don't think they, it makes much sense at all. I don't think it makes any sense at all under the hypothesis of guilt. 
Okay, but you, you are welcome to your opinions and everybody has their own prior opinions about how many serial killers are out there. I, my prior opinion is that there are not very many. And, uh, okay, uh, that's item two. Then of course there's the insulin. And I think I'm not going to talk about the insulin here at all, except to say there are statistical issues here. I'm going to skip this slide. This is just if I need to explain to people what is uh, what what various abbreviations mean, <laughs> and also <laughs> remind you. Uh, well, tell you a funny story that there is also something called a, a, an international unit or a standard unit of insulin, and it's defined not in terms of of chemistry and what you see in the blood, what you can find in the blood, but it's defined in terms of the effect it has on, on, on living uh, beings. And uh, so it's defined in terms of its physiological consequences on, on a, a person, say. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, its effects on a person would probably defend, depend a great deal on what kind of person that is. And in particular, neonatals and uh, premature babies and especially premature neonatals might be rather different from, from adults or older children, healthy children or otherwise healthy children. Uh, uh, the international unit was originally defined as the amount of insulin required to cause convulsive hypoglycemia in a fasted two kilogram rabbit, which doesn't mean a fast rabbit, but a rabbit which hasn't had anything to eat for a couple of days, which is very important. Uh, the effects of insulin Physiologically on you depends extraordinarily much on how much you've eaten recently. This also is an issue in our case, the Lucy Legby case. Um, and of course, there is actually, you know, of course, not all rabbits are the same. And there actually is a literature about the standard rabbit, right? I mean, you breed rabbits and you use one of the standard rabbits with basically the same genes uh, if you want to measure it the old way. I'm not sure how, how an international unit of insulin is defined nowadays. Uh, probably it's been redefined in terms of the picomoles and the micromoles and the millimoles and so on. So it's probably no longer defined physiologically in terms of physiological effect anymore. I don't know. I don't know. But people still do talk about these things. I mean, it is a meaningful thing to talk about physiologically when we're talking about a, 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 a sort of standard reference population of human beings, okay, which we are not in this case. Now, um, uh, okay, the uh, jurors were convinced by the insulin C peptide ratio of in two babies, which was uh, determined by an assay done at uh, pathology labs of the Royal Liverpool something University Hospital. Uh, and uh, a, a sample, a blood sample or serum sample was uh, set, set, sent off. And we don't know whether the serum was separated within 30 minutes of collection and frozen immediately. And uh, we don't know if the sample was received within 30 minutes. Well, whatever. We don't know. It should have been a fasting sample. It, uh, it should have been collected during a hypoglycemic a a attack, but those babies did not have a hypoglycemic attack. They, they were being, there were uh, worries of hypoglycemia, but they were not having a hypoglycemic attack. Those two babies did not suddenly experience severe uh, oscillation in, in, in uh, uh, you know, well, of their health status. They were being continuously monitored for hyperglycemia and, and their blood sugar level was being continuously measured, monitored, and everything was, and nothing happened, nothing happened. But somebody ticked a box and took a sample. It must have been, it must have been done on the instructions of a, uh, of a consultant, a senior doctor. Uh, it needs a senior doctor to approve, uh, to order this, uh, this uh, measurement to be taken. And the important thing is that it, this, the results were never, uh, were never looked at by the doctors responsible for the care of those babies. Nobody saw it. Nobody saw the outcome till three years later when one of the medical consultants dug it up 
a year into a poli heavy police investigation, went sniffing for more evidence against one of his colleagues. Right? Uh, now, um, okay, so when insulin is being made in the body, it's made by splitting some precursor uh, and a big, some big molecule is broken into two. And so you get as many molecules of insulin as uh, C-peptide. Now there is a difference in the rate at which these two quantities are used, uh, broken down by the body. I mean, the insulin, insulin is a hormone. It's used to signal. And uh, you see, you don't want a lot, your body does not want a lot of insulin hanging around. It, it, it breaks down, it, it does, it gives its signal and it is uh, uh, broken down rapidly, I think. And the C-peptide is like a sort of waste product which disappears more slowly. So typically there should be more C-peptide in a healthy person's body than, than insulin. I mean, a, a non-diabetic person, uh, it, there should be more C-peptide C-peptide than insulin, and if you find more insulin than C-peptide, then well, something uh, is is wrong or odd or peculiar. And there are many, many, uh, not very many. There are, are quite a few explanations for a, a badly skewed uh, uh, ratio. Insulin far in in far more uh, presence than a C-peptide. That, that p mole per liter is basically the number of molecules, right? And uh, uh, per liter, and uh, uh, the, there should be more molecules per liter of C-peptide than molecules per liter of insulin if you are a healthy, you know, grown child or adult uh, without various uh, possible illnesses or, 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 or yeah, uh, issues. Um, okay, now uh, I just want to say that there is there should have been statistics here too because those concentrations have got standard errors. It's it's a it's a determination in a lab, and a number comes out. But that number, if you would take three samples at the same time and measure them three times in the same lab, you would get three different numbers. And what would the variation be? It's so important. And what is the variation of the smaller number? We want to look at the ratio. If the if there is a big error in the smaller number, then the ratio is badly off. Like everybody knows this. I, I talked to Vincent uh, Marx about this, and he said that when the lab saw the outcome, they should have immediately phoned the hospital and said uh, and warned them. The, the, this there is something uh, uh, very um, uh, un, unsettling about this outcome. Our test is not the right test to use. You must do other tests at another laboratory, right? Please inform the laboratory so that the sample can be referred externally for analysis. That's what that's what's written on the uh, like on the manual on the brochure which comes along with the test. It's on the website of the lab. And the, the, the lab which did this should have also noticed that uh, their result needed to be uh, redone in a different way, right? The sample can be referred externally for analysis. That's what it said. So this was criminal negligence at the uh, Royal, at the Path Labs, according to Vincent Marx. He was uh, pretty angry about this. I can tell you. Okay, there are explanations they, beyond insulin poisoning, right? There's a lot of evidence that the babies were not poisoned by deliberate uh, admi uh, administration of much too much insulin. Okay, now we've had that. Now, what's that all? Now, of course, that this was not all the evidence and the trial lasted 10 months. And I'm not going to say very much about this particular one. How long have I been talking already? incredibly long time, well, this is already an hour. There's an important thing there. The Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health carried out an investigation. They knew that there were suspicions about the nurse. They knew that there was an, an unusual number of events. They have found out that some of the events were hard to explain. And um, 
they we uh, uh, and we know that when that report came out in public well the, the report led the hospital to ask Cheshire Constabulary to investigate the cause of death. This is a big, 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 big mistake. This was a big mistake of management. Of course, they were being pushed by the doctors. We know that very strongly. Some doctors um, were suspicious of losing. Some doctors were making mistakes. We know that now. Some doctors have said different things on the stand, witness stand, and they uh, earlier said or, or, or wrote, and so on and so on. Um, okay, but anyway, just notice that the hospital asked Cheshire Constabulary to investigate cause of death. So I will come back in a moment, I'm not quite sure when, to what was actually written in that confidential report and, and in the redacted report. So uh, what happened? The police announced the investigation and the newspapers reported it and a, a strange guy turned up at Cheshire police station offering his servants, services. And I don't want to talk about Dr. Dowie Evans here. I will say that I think he's a charlatan and a fool and he's very proud of himself because he thinks he did it all and he, um, I'm not going to talk much, uh, I'm not, I don't want to talk about him anymore. Other people have talked a lot about him. And there's a lot to be very worried about what he did, because whatever, whatever, whether or not he knew that that uh, whether I mean he might have been a, he might well have known from the consultants at the hospital what was going on. They certainly had had contacts in the past, and I really don't believe what he's recently said that when he turned up at the hospital, he had no idea that there were suspicions about a particular nurse. He has said in recent interviews that he was the one who told the police to pull out the, uh, the, the uh, roster data and find which nurses were present at those 32 incidents, which I'm about to talk about. And he was amazed. He was so surprised. I mean, he says it with a beautiful Welsh accent which I can't imitate, that when he saw Lucy Levy's name turning up on baby A, B, C and D, totally surprised, could not, he knew that the police were, were hoping that he would find out that there was some bad bug in the water or something. I, I don't believe a word of this, but okay, you can believe what you like of what he says. And you can look at the contradictions between what he says on different occasions, if it's interesting. Right, now, uh, he was, uh, the police gave him the medical notes of 32 incidents and uh, the numbers changed occasionally. I'm not quite sure. According to him, they were in a big mess. They were all jumbled up together. Half of them were deaths and the other half were collapses. I mean, you know, collapses with successful resuscitation. Uh, the deaths probably were preceded by a, a collapse too, uh, right? Uh, but when I talk about collapses from now on, I mean a collapse, a non-fatal collapse. Non, not immediately fatal collapse. Now, by the way, many deaths and collapses concern the same infants, many concern members of twins and triplets, and many were very premature. And uh, this should be a warning to statisticians out there. This means that uh, if like the same bad thing happens to, to three babies who are brothers and sisters of one another, it, uh, there are correlations between, they, you can expect correlation. That those babies share a lot of genes. They have shared an environment, for goodness sake. They have shared an, the environment of their mother's womb for the last so many months, sometimes not enough months. So uh, we can expect actually clusters. We can expect groups of events more often than if events were all independent. They're not independent. They are very closely connected, and we will expect to see bigger variances. It's called over-dispersion. Okay, a, a difficult statistical word. We expect more than Poisson variation. We expect it. Okay, now there's the rest of the story. And notice how when Lucy Letby was arrested, the TV vans were in the street before the police arrived. Notice that what she was subjected to for um, years, and all that time she had that box underneath her bed and she had a shredder 
and didn't use it. And she was a careful, conscientious nurse. Uh, let me tell you that Lucia de Berg advice uh, to uh, all, all her colleagues was to keep everything, do take notes home and keep them. Because when it's a doctor's word against the nurse's word, the nurse is not going to be believed. So make notes, keep notes, keep what you can always, and don't trust anybody. I mean, it's very sad. Don't even trust your closest friend, who you think is your closest friend, because you can be sorely disappointed in life. And she was, and so was Lucy. Right, some important things there. Okay, well, okay, so we know that uh, uh, Lucy, Lucy was charged of eight murders and uh, the rest, 24 attempts. And the jury returned a lot of verdicts after a long time, a long, long time, and the judge announced the sentence. And there were, the verdict was seven murders and 15 murder attempts. And it's interesting that, important to mention that the jury was reduced in size by one because one person left uh, towards the end. And that uh, almost all of the uh, um, uh, verdicts were not unanimous. They were all not unanimous except for the two insulin uh, um, crimes, <laughs> alleged crimes. Those were the only two where the jury was, was unanimous. Okay, now what does not unanimous mean? It means that there were 11 jurors and 10 they said uh, stuck to guilt and one stuck to innocence. So it's, uh, but still, uh, the British jury system is supposed to be such that at the end of the trial, the jury is all convinced. That's how the system is designed. That's what you're supposed to have. It's very unusual to allow uh, a non uh, a majority verdict. It's very, very unusual. This, this judge was very intent on doing his job as he saw it. And I, okay. I promise not to say too much about my opinion of the judge. He was very close to retirement. He was he's a stickler for rules and doing his job, and he wanted to do his job according to the book. And I think he was sorely misled by the evidence he also saw and uh, gave some wrong instructions, definitely wrong because he didn't understand the difference. Uh, I will come back to that probably, but there is a difference between a legal fact and a true fact, right? So if it's legal, if you've legally found to have murdered somebody, it doesn't mean that you truly have, there may still be doubt. I will come back to this issue, it's a very important one. That, I mean, it, okay, it, it may be beyond reasonable doubt on one day, on one case, but beyond reasonable doubt does, mean, does allow doubt. And if you allow for doubt and, and bring that into the reasoning, Things change, as I'll explain, I hope. Okay, full life sentence. Now, I, I just want to say that uh, there was a mountain of evidence, sure. And I think that the mountain of evidence was used to hide the fact that there was actually no real evidence. Uh, I would, will say that all of the evidence is circumstantial. Well, actually, some people will say all evidence is circumstantial, and that is really true. Uh, some evidence is stronger and some evidence is weaker. These concepts of stronger and weaker evidence are, are not even legal concepts. I'm not sure that circumstantial is a legal concept, but it's, uh, there's, I mean, direct, you could talk about direct and indirect, but I mean, direct proof is not really direct. If you, somebody says they saw somebody stab somebody, but you weren't there, you have to trust that witness. Uh, if a video seems to show somebody stabbing somebody, you have to trust your judgment that the person you see on the video is the same as the person who's in the dock. Um, a confession is only a confession when it's been taken down with your uh, with your own uh, legal uh, team, you know, your solicitor with you, and it, and a policeman there, and it has all the right signatures. Then we can, then uh, uh, an, uh, then a uh, confession is legally taken to be definitive. 
though still sensible people know that a confession is at, even such a confession it can easily be forced by by police in investigation techniques <laughs> and threats and and has occurred many times so even a legal confession is not really a confession though it does um, have a lot of weight in a in a in a trial um uh, forensic scientists uh, know that and policemen also know that the confession is important when the person who confesses reveals information which only the perpetrator could have known and which nobody else knows except that the police does know from their investigations right so the police find out some information about how the crime was committed and they don't tell anybody and they must and they're allowed not to tell anybody i mean they have to tell it at the trial but during interrogations they are, they do not tell it suppose they arrest somebody and interrogate them and they admit and they tell the police things which the police already know but nobody else knows about what actually happened and which are confirmed by you know forensic science and so on and so forth that's a confession which proves things now uh the famous case of uh, a guy in america his name I, oh charles cullen right he confessed to his uh, to his girlfriend wearing a, a a microphone a hidden microphone and she had actually believed he was innocent and uh, this is very very strong evidence i would say I'm not sure if he continued to claim to be innocent after this was shown in the court or not. But okay, I, I, I'm not saying that Charles Cullen is innocent. I'm not saying that every serial killer and nurse, every convicted serial killer and nurse is innocent. Of course not, of course not. I'm not saying that Beth Allard is innocent. I have some worries about that case. And uh, fortunately, my worries have been allayed by other things I found out later, which are not on the Wikipedia page, but which some insiders do know. So, okay, so right now I'm inclined to believe that Beth Allard was guilty, uh, but I do see a lot of worrisome uh, features in what you can read about about her case. Anyway, right, so um, I, uh, it, it's clear to me now, and uh, you just have to go to some other websites which are there now and look for yourself. Every event has a natural explanation though. They are connected to uh, sepsis, infections, um, uh, bad care by doctors, uh, all kinds of mistakes by the, the, the doctors. Well, perhaps the most important thing was that they were not there enough. The senior doctors were not there enough. They didn't supervise the younger people. There were not enough senior nurses Lucy herself was fully qualified, but she did not yet have enough experience to be thought of as a very senior nurse. Uh, and she was no doubt also making mistakes. We, we know that uh, resuscitation attempts were continued uh, too long, too many times and probably caused damage. Uh, maybe a more experienced uh, and older nurse, she was only 25, could have uh, realized that uh, they were carrying out the trying the resuscitation too many times and should have stopped. But I mean, the doctor should have been there and stopped it and let the baby die. You know, right. As I say, the rise in the number of deaths does have natural explanations connected to, to hospital pathogens and connected to the leaking sewage in the floor above. Uh, right. Uh, it's true that some events are hard to explain. And the doctors are blamed by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health for this because they did not allow or wish to or start proper investigations at the time. And no samples were retained. No forensic samples were retained. Everything is gone. So we cannot, uh, we will never find out actually. Right. Now, of course, uh, uh, the British 
public uh, tends to believe that Lucy is an evil killer and, and there are all kinds of things going on. Uh, police believe that they caught their woman and they believe she killed more people too and a new investigation has started and uh, our friend Dr. Dowie uh, Evans uh, thinks that there are quite a few more deaths which were caused or others caused by Lucy. Prosecution has appealed against one of the not guilty verdicts. Reporting restrictions have been imposed. Well, that's in, that's uh, useful for uh, uh, people who believe she's guilty. Anybody who speaks out and says they think she's innocent could be guilty of contempt of court. I'm not sure if that applies to me now, speaking from the Netherlands as a scientist. There will be a public inquiry to find out why the hospital directors stopped the medical consultants from going to the police because the verbal inquiry is based on the legal truth that Lucy Letby is a serial killer. And we know that the doctors have complained about the fact that it took so long to stop her. All right. Lucy has asked for an appeal. Okay. Uh, the police is also the uh, uh, I believe the police is also preparing for a, 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 um, a trial of hospital management for the crime of corporate manslaughter, right? So uh, the prosecution is not finished yet and the police is not finished yet and the British public is not finished yet, it seems. Now, uh, I go back now to 2017, and this reconstruction is found by somebody else, and I think it's uh, brilliant, and I find the evidence for this reconstruction rather convincing. The 32 incidents were, I think, compiled by senior medical consultants, right? Uh, the the, the uh, hospital management folded to the medical consultants. They had been at loggerheads, the doctors had been wanting to, to start a police investigation. The management didn't. But after the RCPCH report came out, the uh, management caved in uh, and uh, information was sent to the police. But who compiled that, med that evidence? I doubt, I don't believe it can have been the management. I believe it must have been the medical consultants. And especially when you look at what was sent to the police, they sent to the police uh, the medical dossiers of, of, of events, right? Not of babies, but of events, of all 16 deaths which occurred. Well, you know, there was a problem about what you mean by death, but anyway, they sent information of 16 deaths from January 2015 to June 2016, right? This is painting a target around, around the victim, who is Lucy. That's what it is. It's absolutely clearly that, because especially when you see what comes next, they include 16 collapses. I mean, there were 16 deaths and 16 collapses in that compilation, and the collapses are all when Lucy was on duty. Okay, so the police gets these uh, dossiers, like 32 uh, cases, not babies, 32 cases. And lo and behold, a strange doctor turns up at the police station, Dr. Dowie Evans, and uh, offers his services. And uh, he went through those 32 notes and they were all jumbled up together. He had to sort them all out and put them into order, I suppose, order of time. It was a big mess. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Well, that's what he says, has said. He sorted them out and he went through them looking for, you could say, forensic uh, uh, indications of something odd. And he found something peculiar. And by the way, he's not qualified for this at all. He, he has not uh, treated patients for, for 15 years or had not at that time. Uh, he is not a forensic scientist. He's not a scientist. He is very active in, in Welsh politics and in paediatrics politics. Uh, okay, but uh, anyway, he, he went through those 32 very carefully. 
And surprise, surprise, he found something odd in events which happened when Lucy was there and only in such events. And these odd things were like a bubble you could see in, in, in a bubble of air or something in, in a, some sort of medical photo or uh, evidence of liver damage you know, at post-mortem or uh, whatever and whatever. He, he, he found odd things in, in uh, basically, well, in the events which happened, in events which happened when Lucy was there, of course, he was guaranteed to, right? There were a few deaths from uh, January 2015 to June 2015, which are obviously completely normal. The, 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 there were, I mean, babies with, with uh, deformities, which meant they were going to die fast. And obviously nobody caused them. I mean, no, no medical personnel caused them. They were natural deaths. He spotted the natural deaths. Obviously, they were well, they were easy to fish out. No, what what's left? Mostly deaths when Lucy was there. You know, she was working so hard and such long hours, and so on and so forth, and often filling in for when nurses were away. She lived close by. She was keen. She was energetic. She wanted experience. She wanted to learn. She was willing to do anything. You know, she did things that she, maybe she was not. Quali not qualified enough, not experienced enough to do, but she had to because she was the one who was there. Right. Anyway, Dowie Evans found something odd, and he says he's the one who told police to look at the nursing roster, and he was the one who spotted Lucy's event at Lucy's presence at event after event. I think I've said this all. By the way, it's rather interesting and I think very significant that he did not spot the anomalous insulin measurements. Dr. Breary found them in 2018 when he was going back snuffling again in those uh, in those uh, files, the data, medical data. Dowie Evans did not have babies, did not find Lucy doing anything wrong for babies F or L. I'm not even, I don't even know if they were in his 32. Maybe they were. We should find out. Okay, that's very important. Now, how could everything have gone so wrong? I mean, I, I, I hope you, I, I'm convinced that everything went terribly wrong and there are many reasons for it. And there are many reasons why they went more wrong than in the Lucy Letby case. The defense basically did not do anything. They, they did find one expert and some people say two. That expert turned up at a, prior, at a pre-trial meeting, found out that the prosecution's experts were talking about toxicology and, and um, uh, endocrinology, and he was not an expert in those things, so he just did not have anything much to say. And he was only one anyway, and um, probably not a very expensive expert. Uh, uh, people have said to me, I mean, real <laughs> people who know a lot about this say, said, if you want a medical expert to speak for the defense in a case where children have been murdered, uh, allegedly have been murdered, you must get an expert from the UK, uh, uh, sorry, from the US, and they will be expensive and you must find the right one. So you have to know a lot. You have to know what kind of expert you want and you have to have cash to pay for somebody to fly in from the US because you won't find top UK medical experts. They won't, they, they will decline. They will already be convinced by what they've seen and heard in the press, by the way. Uh, as I mentioned, neither prosecution nor defense use statistical or epidemiological evidence. And I think I, this is a good point to say. Oh, well, I'll say it later. Uh, uh, there's something I want to say about why they didn't. I'll say it right now. The uh, uh, a, a senior member of the Crown Prosecution S Service told me before the trial started, we are not using any statistics because it only confuses people. Well, I'm sure it would have confused the prosecution and the police and the jury if they had you if they had taken evidence pre-trial from a qualified statistician or epidemiologist, 
they would have found out that their case was much weaker than they thought it was. Whether it would have even gone to trial is, for me, dubious. I mean, they, de they deliberately didn't because they knew that it only confuses jurors and policemen and prosecutors and the public. They know that, they've learned that by experience. Right, the defense had a plumber and <laughs> his evidence is really important. And of course he was mainly caused, called to the hospital to attend to, to the shit floating around in the floor of the maternity ward. And it was 30 meters away from the uh, neonatal ward. And an expert said that of course viruses can't travel 30 meters. And my God, uh, yes, they do, and babies do, and people do, and mums and dads do, and clothing, and bedding, and cots. Yes, a lot moves 30 meters in a hospital, including viruses and bacteria. So the fact that the shit wasn't on the floor in the neonatal ward is irrelevant. It was on the floor in the maternity ward a number of times. It's called sewage backflow, by the way. Very, uh, <clears throat> yes. The plumbing, by the way, got replaced. And one of the things that changed in 2017 was that the plumbing got fixed, or in 2018. And uh, later still, the whole uh, ward has been demolished. The building has been demolished and the ground has been excavated, right? That's called destroying the evidence. Right, so there was a, the defense made a big, big uh, uh, a mistake, which was agreeing with the insulin evidence, which they shouldn't have been at all, because there are numerous innocent explanations for the in, for the anomalous insulin measurement results. And anyway, those results, I mean, the measurement was the wrong measurement to have been taken. And uh, I, I, I mean, any any defense lawyer worth their salt. Uh, with a good witness, a uh, scientific uh, uh, expert to back him up, would have would have have ruled that evidence inadmissible. Perhaps I mean would have argued that it was inadmissible. I think there are good reasons to say it's inadmissible. It's it's, it's scandalous that it was admitted. I would say, uh, judge should have uh, stopped that. But what do judges know about toxicology and the? Uh, what do judges know of the um, official uh, guidelines, uh, code of behavior of forensic experts uh, uh, for, for, for trials, criminal trials in, in the UK? Well, obviously judges have never read through those, those uh, rules and regulations or guides. And nor have defense lawyers. It's a, it's a scandal. Well, <clears throat> there's a big thing that the great British public, it seems to me, has never been so uneducated as it is now. And uh, obviously, a lot has changed in the last 20 years between Lu Lucy de Berg and Lucy Letby, and a lot of differences between England and the UK. Sorry, between England and, uh, sorry, England and Netherlands. But it seems that the great British public does not realize that a guilty verdict does not mean you are guilty. The, British public seems to have forgotten about uh, the um, presumption of innocence. The British public seems to not to understand that everybody ought to be able to appeal against the conviction, especially for very serious crime. In all other countries, this is just uh, taken for granted. But in the in England, the great British public does not think that Lucy should appeal. They do not think her appeal should be granted. They trust their doctors. They trust their police. They trust their courts, and they have so many reasons not to. But they, I it just it's just so. I mean, I don't know. They they trust their, their amateur psychology. They saw the mugshot. They uh, understood that Lucy was proven to have lied. So she's a killer. Nothing ever goes wrong in the NHS. What will happen next? Well, lots of things are happening, and I would move on rapidly to the next. Are the cases essentially the same or essentially different? Well, they are essentially the same and they are essentially different, yes and no. 
Now, uh, the, the very important thing I want to point out here is that there is no objective definition of unexpected, unexplained collapse. The, the, even the collapse is not like a medical category. It's not saved in hospital databases. We have no idea how many unexpected, unexplained collapses occurred when Lucy wasn't there. Uh, experts tell me probably five times as many as it happened when she was there given the ward and the kind of patients who were there. But, but or, or, anyway, it's, it's um, I mean, an expert can give an opinion whether they think something is unexpected or unexplained and whether it counts as a collapse. I mean, some apparatus making a beeping noise is not necessarily a collapse. And, uh, there, there should have been made a definition of something and that criterion should have been applied to cases when Lucy was not there as well as when she was there in order to see if there's any real difference between when she's there and when she's not there. Right. Um, now I'd like to go through the last uh, few slides of my talk. Okay, take off 16 from 24. These eight, eight slides. I want to talk about the statistical issues. And of course, many of them were not there because no statistics was done except for that uh, spit silly spreadsheet, which is an example of uh, lies, damn lies, and lying statistics. Uh, the thing is that those events were suspicious because Lucy was there. So finding out that she was there when she was there is not a great surprise. Um, I think I mentioned before the question of overdispersion. We uh, we have maybe, um, well, whatever number, numbers keep change, changing, uh, eight, eight, seven deaths and and 15, <laughs> and, and 15 resuscitations, which were successful for a while, which makes 22 events. Those 22 events are not independent. They, they include two, two clusters of three triplets. They include several pairs. Uh, and uh, all kinds of things are happening all the time on the hospital, which means that things are changing, which means that some days the chance of events is bigger than other days. And all of this all together means that we can expect over dispersion. And if you already, if you do ordinary Poisson statistics, you can see that the, the list of numbers which we saw before, the numbers of deaths over there, over six years, two before, two during, two after, those that, that that list of of numbers is actually not surprising at all, and it can be easily thought to be even less surprising because uh, because of over dispersion. We expect bigger variants than Poisson, bigger variants than the mean. Uh, we expect some some of those numbers to be extra large and other numbers to be extra small. Well, which means, uh, of course, uh, very close to zero, zero or one or two. Uh, this is just what we expect. Um, now, uh, there are all kinds of problems with people's understanding of statistics. The public doesn't understand it. Doctors don't understand science, don't understand statistics, sorry. Um, doctors need statistics. Statistics is used to improve statistical treatments through, through evidence-based medicine, but they, they themselves don't really understand it, and they... Uh, are, are suspicious of statisticians they just need them to get p-values to get their papers published um in the, and that, that's a pro general problem within a, quite a lot of science that uh, lots of people use statistics but in science but uh, don't really understand it and, and they're not skilled science sci they're not skilled statisticians uh, statisticians have a special role in science, namely to play the devil's advocate, which is to say, look, uh, you, you think you found something really interesting there, but I'm telling you, your sample is so tiny uh, that what you s thought is such an incredible um, association between a good treatment, what you think is a good treatment and good outcomes, uh, that could just have been due to chance. Your treatment maybe is no better than, than placebo. Okay, so uh, uh, that's a problem. There's a problem that, that people are incredibly <laughs> impressed by numbers. And if somebody says one in 342 million and they're a professor and they uh, look very wise and nod sagely and, and 
explain that they can't really explain it how they got that number um they can try to explain some of the principles but most people will lose lose them on the way and never be able to follow them into the details yet as when when scientists tell numbers uh people tend to believe them and that they forget that all numbers in science are subject to all kinds of errors and that they depend on all kinds of assumptions and the assumptions may not be true in fact science is all about challenging the assumptions of existing science all the time all the time we're actually looking for ways to, we should be scientists are basically all the time looking for ways to disprove the science which is already there because that's how science progresses by seeing that things are not exactly how people thought they were uh, 10 years ago 20 years ago or 100 years ago okay now we're in a situation where people are dying all the time at hospital i mean not a, not a huge number in, on this particular ward but uh, it, it's normal for premature babies to be born with all kinds of difficulties and not to live long so this is a place where people are dying all the time the babies are dying all the time and it's terribly sad and traumatic actually for every, of course for everybody uh, but it means uh, it means that there is a, a big 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 problem and let's move let's move on to it oh well before that let's look at a couple of other problems I'll say what the, the big problem is in, in a moment um, a, a big problem is that the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, they saw that there was something odd going on and they saw a few cases which they didn't understand what had happened. I mean, probably the members of the committee which investigated uh, did not have the right expertise to, to do that. They felt that something should be done to find out what was causing that strange miscoloration in a few of the babies, remember? they recommended a forensic investigation of the cases which they did not understand now remember they also investigated whether there was a connection with any nurses and they did not find a connection with any nurses they knew full well that the doctors were suspicious of nurses and even wanted to report nurse a nurse to uh, to the police uh, but they uh, seems they did not buy the the they, they didn't buy that they felt that some more they did tell the doctors off for not investing not having properly investigated a number of the deaths and a number of the strange occurrences in, in on the contrary there were there were uh, no investigations were done all all, uh, all uh, samples were long gone they, that's why they uh, suggested a forensic investigation of some a few of those cases where people did not agree or did not know what the course was and of course the course is often multifactorial so even if you investigate it even if you had investigated it then at the time properly and carefully uh, you you don't find uh, there's there is usually not a single course there are a, a, a collection of courses and there's some bad luck and there are often by the way uh, medical errors which, uh, medical errors are the third most common cause of death in hospitals next to heart disease and uh, heart disease and cancer now so I think what went wrong right at the beginning was that the Countess of Chester Hospital apparently caved into the doctors and uh, allowed them to control a police investigation and <laughs> one of the problems is that uh, people in the UK don't know anymore what forensic science is UK used to have the best forensic science institute in the world but it, it got closed down some of the best people in the world especially in uh, forensic DNA for instance went to other countries uh, lots of small businesses started up and not all equally high quality you you do not go to the police to do a forensic investigation you or uh, you get a good advice and you find a good forensic science investigative institute and there are many excellent places in the world possibly the best ones in this case would have been in neighboring countries Ireland or the Netherlands I would have suggested uh, you go to a forensic science institute which is um, for money doing forensic science investigations and which is as close as possible to a university research departments and uh, uh, and teaching hospitals 
uh, research hospitals where the, the best expertise, the latest expertise is, is on tap very close by. So, and as I said, uh, I think there should have been a comparison of collapses when Lucy was present with those when she was not present. And we, it, this is kind of impossible because a, a, a collapse is not something which is defined uh, in some rigorous or, or, or um, unambiguous way. I mean, it doesn't have to be the only possible definition, but we need a definition which can be verified by independent researchers looking at medical records. You have to write down what you're going to call a collapse. And you don't, you don't write down what you call a collapse by looking at the collapses which were that happened when Lucy was there and then deciding that this is what you call a collapse. And then, <laughs> right, it's not the way to, to do this. That indeed, there should have been a comparison of the death rate when Lucy was present with the death rate when other nurses were present or when she wasn't present. And we know perfectly well that it would have been much the same because we know that the overall death rate was high. We know that there were more deaths when Lucy wasn't there than when she was there. Of course, she was uh, she was there a, a lot, so we want to take account of how much of the time she was present, but she was present a very great deal of the time. Um, and uh, okay, this is where there is a word about statistics. Advanced statistics allows one to do these comparisons, taking account of all the things which you might think of, and even to some extent, things which you don't think of by uh, 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 creating artificial matched pairs, for instance. Uh, find two collapses, one where Lucy's there. I mean, for each collapse when Lucy's there, find one which is very similar when she's not there, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, um, okay, it is rocket science. St uh, modern statistics is rocket science. It's not just common sense. Of course, it's based on common sense, and it should be common sense that it is necessary, and that is uh, what I think is the main failing here in this case. Now, the Royal Statistical Society had in advance, published a report on dealing with uncertainty in in uh, such cases. And uh, uh, myself, together with four colleagues from around the world, both from law and from statistics, had worked for two years putting down on paper the best knowledge and experience uh, which there is uh, uh, in 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 the world on this on in this. Uh, on this question and i will turn quite soon to to the recommendations which we make and of course the <laughs> terrible thing is that the recommendations were not made particularly the recommendations concerning police investigation because police investigation had happened and was more or less completed long before our report was finished though uh, uh, before our report was actually published maybe a month before the trial started we had already presented it several months before to uh, uh, representatives of shareholders, including police and including Crown Prosecution Service persons at a afternoon meeting at the Newton Institute in Cambridge, uh, at which, uh, I'm not sure if I said this before, but at which I met a member of the regional Crown Prosecution Service and uh, everybody who was there knew that we were thinking that our work might be useful for the Lucy Letby case. I spoke to him at the tea break. He looked rather bored and had clearly not really appreciated much what he'd heard so far. So far. And he told me uh, in person, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, well, we're, we're not using any statistics in this case. It, we, it only makes people confused. Right. Statistics makes prosecutors confused makes lawyers confused, certainly confuses policemen, confuses juries, confuses the public, and they weren't having any of that because there shouldn't be any confusion. And uh, the prosecute, the UK Prose Crown Prosecution Service and the UK police forces, they have learned through experience what convinces juries and, and at the same time, of course, what convinces the public and they made absolutely good use of that. Now, what, what convinces the, indeed the public that the uh, brave police have uh, uncovered a terrible killer and uh, 
the uh, state uh, prosecution service is, is putting her away as fast as possible to make everybody safe again. Um, the uh, what did I want to say? The uh, Crown Prosecution Service and the police have uh, learned very well how to play to the media and, of course, to the jury uh, uh, to make sure that everybody uh, uh, sees that they've done the right thing here. Now, um, there are two big problems with cases like these, and they are, of course, uh, uh, it, the, the main one is, is the simple problem that there are, we are looking at deaths which occur in a place where people die. So deaths could have occurred for reasons other than murder. This is not like finding somebody in the street with a knife in their back. Of course, I mean, it might have fallen out of an upstairs window or something. And I, you know, you can, it might have been some kind of weird suicide. But uh, generally speaking, when police investigate a crime, they know that crime has been committed. Here, we do not know there has been a crime committed. Uh, uh, you have got to find out if a crime has been com com committed. Uh, I would say, I think common sense says it would be very smart to find, first of all, find out whether or not a crime has been committed at all. Uh, once you've found out if a crime has com been committed, uh, then you're in a good situation in a hospital to use all kinds of resources in the hospital to find out uh, 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 who is, which persons are possibly uh, responsible person or persons if murder was the cause is the person under suspicion responsible but these cases always start with a hospital going to police with a dossier of suspicious events and a, an already well-known suspicious nurse who the hospital already typically believes or important persons in the hospital already are pretty sure is an evil person who needs to be stopped. And indeed, she often already has been stopped. She's been taken off the ward. So th there are questions A and B to be considered, and I think they should be considered separately. Unfortunately, jurors are not able to do that. I mean, uh, the jurors in the Lucy Letby case were told uh, baby by baby what had happened and it, they were supposed to decide each separate case separately on its own merits but they can't do that no sane person can do that uh, what we know jurors tend to do is to tend to focus on some smoking gun uh, or some or just their gut feelings and and it's pretty clear what that what those uh, smoking guns and gun uh, and gut feelings were um in the lucy letby case and i talked about that earlier uh, I'll come back to this issue again in a, in a little while. Um, now, the report calls for more care to be taken by experts to avoid drawing erroneous inferences from such data by properly controlling for plausible causal factors. And we are uh, very concerned about the problem of unconscious bias influencing section of selection of cases, classification of cases, even even. Um, influencing medical experts' opinions, medical opinions about individual cases. And this is why we have some certain recommendations and we will turn to them uh, now, I think. No, well, here at the, <laughs> we published the report, 64 pages. If you think that's too long, there's a short version. I wish everybody would read it i would hope people would read it before listening to watching this talk or listening to this talk uh, and if not do it afterwards you can start with the short one there's a whole lot you can skip there because there's a whole lot explaining what our p-values and things like that but nobody used the p-value in this case in the lucy letby case so you can skip a number of our recommendations because they're about issues of explaining standard statistical concepts to lay persons, including judges and lawyers and the media. And they were not really relevant in this case because the standard statistical methodology was not used by either side, which is a great scandal. Okay, so here are uh, uh, just uh, four of our, I think, eight recommendations. These are four, which I think are important. 
Now, uh, our recommendation number four is investigations should be guided by panels re representing all relevant areas of expertise, but, and I would perhaps like to emphasize, and independent of both the suspect and the employing institution. And um, this is about investigations. So we, I'm thinking here about investigations in the hospital. Uh, investigations, uh, I'm thinking of investigations like the RCPCH investigation and the investigation which should have followed, which should have been a forensic scientific investigation. And um, the, uh, the expertise should be independent of both the suspect and the employing institution. Now, for instance, in a medical case of medical crime at a hospital, possible medical crime, doctors are also should also be considered to possibly be expert. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, they may well, they certainly have expertise, but they don't have forensic expertise. They may not have relevant scientific expertise. They uh, do not have forensic scientific training. They don't have a forensic scientific mindset. They have the mindset of a doctor, which is uh, learn everything you can about the case in front of you and then, and then uh, d decide what to do, come up with a diagnosis and, and do your best given that diagnosis, which means doctors are used to be judges. They, they take life and death, death decisions. They take a knife to op cut you open while you're still alive. Um, whatever. Uh, this is what they are trained for, what their mindset is, uh, how they're selected to be good at doing that, making that kind of dramatic decisions under a huge amount of uncertainty, but at the same time appearing confident and certain of their decisions because, of course, no uh, patient trusts the doctor who seems to be terribly uncertain. So that was uh, recommendation four. Okay, it didn't happen. Um, and here we have this uh, a, a strengthening of that. While such an investigation is going on, we so, so recommend that experts are blinded to the aspects of the case irrelevant to the question they're being asked to answer. Uh, blinding is a key tool in minimizing prejudicial subjective effects such as unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is everywhere. Uh, when when, a, when a, a medical specialist knows that they're investigating a case where a patient perhaps was harmed by a nurse, a nurse who has seems to have probably harmed a lot of more people because there's a trial going on now of that person. They are, they are, they are biased. Uh, that we saw the bias explicitly in the Lu Lucia de Berg case. Uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, well, we didn't. We, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure if we can say it was clear in the Lucy Letby case, but um, it, it's clear that all the experts who were used on the defense side knew exactly what was going on and they were being paid to help the prosecution they weren't even weren't even um uh, sort of threatened by experts from the defense so there was simply no possibility for their unconscious bias to have been removed by being properly challenged by competent experts in, in, uh, who had been um informed by the uh, instructed yes instructed this is a terrible word scientists sh should not be instructed by one side or the other side of a quarrel about scientific things scientists should do what they're going to do whoever gives them the information of course it's important that they make clear what information they have been given but they are not there to uh, to favor the person who's paying for them um, okay, it is vital that investigators appreciate the truth of the well-known aphorism, correlation is not causation, and should realize that, that there are lots and lots of criteria and methodology for taking care of not confusing correlation for causation. So in general, one can say if you see correlation, there typically is causation behind it, but whether it's A causing B or B causing A, or something else causing A and B, or selection based on consequences of A and B. 
So that's uh, <laughs> that's causation working backwards in time by selecting cases where you see certain things, you uh, you can create correlation in the possible causes of those things. And it can, can be very surprising and wrong one. Um, okay, when recommendation seven, when courts must evaluate the results of problematic investigations, it's particularly important that they consider reports and expert testimony from independent statisticians. If investigative bias is a significant concern, lawyers and courts should consider seeking evaluations from experts in cognitive bias and factors associated with the accuracy of expert judgment. Okay, so these are all the things which went wrong in the, the Lucy Letby trial, uh, first the investigation and then the trial, and they mean that her conviction is unsafe. Uh, there, there needs to be a retrial, and there needs to be a retrial which takes account of these, these issues. Now, um, uh, uh, I want to, at the end of the lecture, draw your attention to a paper. Actually, it's a newspaper. It's a, it's a science journalist's article. And it's actually a profile of myself, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to blow my own horn here. This is a fantastic article by a, a very experienced science journalist, Kathleen O'Grady, who works for uh, the journal Science. Uh, she uh, interviewed me in Leiden. So she's based in, in Scotland, I think. She's also a freelance journalist. Uh, but she, in particular, this time she was uh, working on a, a project for the science journal, the famous journal. And he, he interviewed me for a number of days and uh, wrote a beautiful paper about the problems of serial killer nurse cases. And I plan to draw your attention to this uh, which is she, uh, she well here she is actually doing some things with p-values but you can kind of see it by looking at the pictures um in on the top line is a severely biased investigation so the, 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 these numbers are just made up and, and but it's very similar to the lucia de Berg case very similar to numbers in the lucy letby case and first of all the first picture shows uh, uh, deaths marked in blue when nurse X is on duty. And as you see there, oh no, there, there seem to be no other deaths at all. She was there every time. And once she killed two people in one day, it seems, or in one month, sorry, in one month. And, uh, but look at the story. Investigators look at deaths on nurses X's shifts and find nine that were medically unexpected. Medically unexpected. That's not well defined, by the way. That's an opinion. Uh, other other doctors could find uh, find them not unexpected. Uh, they judge those investigators that two more deaths should be added. One that occurred fifteen minutes after a shift ended. Right? She might have caused that too. And another that the pathologist did not consider unexpected at the time, but now finds suspicious, knowing X was present. Right? So now we have eleven. Uh, uh, deaths all when Lucy, sorry, X was on duty. And uh, obviously this cannot be random. And there's a calculation, there's a little R script uh, uh, and uh, there's some uh, kind of personal statistics. I, I can even say leading to a probability of one in 80, 83 million. This is the probability that this pattern could occur by chance, right? Uh, whole, uh, uh, the, everybody gasps, everybody's convinced. Now, we reinvent, but okay, so this is how such cases tend to go wrong. When this kind of data is presented, which has been obtained in this way, and uh, if a statistician does a calculation, it, it it just confirms what you can see, namely that this can't be chance. This isn't chance. It's explained why it's chance up there, why, uh, why it wasn't chance. It was a severely biased investigation. Now we do it less biased. Uh, we look better and we look at all deaths over the last two years, not just over the two years in question. These are, these are months here. And we find five unexpected deaths. Okay, we're looking for unexpected deaths. This has to be defined as well. We find five unexpected deaths when she wasn't there. Now, this does not look quite so suspicious anymore. It's still somewhat suspicious and it's pretty extreme. Uh, a probability calculation using conventional, uh, rather unsophisticated methods not controlling for con for confounding factors, so alternative explanations. 
not taking account of other factors, uh, finds the probability of one in 10,000, which is okay. Uh, this is rather, rather surprising. And, and uh, together with other evidence might lead to a guilty verdict. Now, suppose we re-examine the deaths without knowing which nurse was on duty. Uh, uh, we do not reassign to nurse X the death that occurred after her shift ended, and we do not reclassify the death which was actually considered normal at the time. Do not reclassify the death considered normal at the time. Now we get down to a probability of one in 500. So it's still, um, okay, there's, there's definitely a correlation between the, these unexpected deaths and uh, nurse X's presence. There is a correlation, but what could be causing it? Well, okay, the nurse could be a killer. Now the nurse is, no, sorry, now the investigators look for some other factors which could explain the pattern. And they they investigate, actually, they find just one. I mean, they, they take account of just one. There, there must be many, of course, possible factors. They need to be all taken account of. Statisticians have methods for that. It is rocket science. It's hard. You have to trust us. You have to hire very well qualified people and you have to have their work tested by other people right both sides need to employ a very qualified statistician in the uk situation uh, now we take account of uh, of uh, day shifts versus afternoon shifts uh, uh deaths between 7 a.m and 2 p.m versus deaths between i think there must be a misprint here 2 2 p.m and 4 a.m probably or, or what, or have I not, am I not reading this properly? Anyway, so uh, 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 this pick, this is, is, I think is what is meant, morning or afternoon. Now we find out that most of the deaths occur in the, mo in the morning and less in the afternoon, but the nurse in question works less often in the afternoon. Okay, well, she's, what is the probability of seeing such a pattern as this? by chance uh would, would you would, what do you think when you see that pattern do you think the nurse x is suspicious because she's certainly got more seems to have more deaths than she ought to in 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 the mornings um okay the afternoons seem to be not so important well let's do let's get a pro let's get a statistician to calculate a probability it's one in 45 let me call it just one in 50. it's okay it's it's um notable maybe but it's this is not hard evidence against this nurse this pattern is not a smoking gun it might be a reason to look more closely uh, and if you look more closely you might find that you could explain all the, the events if you look more closely you might find out that you could explain the, the apparent correlation with, with Nurse X by taking account of yet more things, such as changes in hospital policy, uh, raising and lowering numbers of patients, so on and so forth. This is a beautiful example, and, and uh, um, I think everybody should uh, read the, this uh, particular paper very well. And if you're a statistician at all, uh, get hold of the R scripts and do, do some of your own experiments and learn how to deal with these things because so we need people like you on these cases. Now, uh, at the end, I just want to say how much help I had by so many people. I mean, I, I have not done much of this work here at all. I, I worked for two years preparing our, our report. Uh, and, and I meant, want to mention a lot of people, uh, some amateurs, some professionals, who have done fantastic work. At the top here are, th are three uh, professionals, Sarita Adams on the medical side, Peter Elston. I wrote here lots of great statistics, very good statistical work there. M much more statistical work can be done if we would have more data and, and more access to more records. Scott McLachlan does medicine and, and uh, uh, statistics and, uh, and hospital organization and management and uh, IT and is fantastic. Uh, okay, there are a couple, here are a couple of amateurs who have done really absolutely brilliant work, and in particular, I want to m name Mark Mays. This is not his real name, I, I think, but maybe it's his uh, uh, what's it called it's artist uh, artist's name. He's also a musician and a poet, and he has done incredible investigations, which uh, 
should have been done long ago. I should have thought of doing them myself. I mean, anybody should have, somebody should have thought of doing. A statistician for the defense should have insisted that they were done. Perhaps there was such a one, but their advice was not used. Uh, find out how those cases were, were, were collected, who collected the cases, who collect, selected the dossiers which went to the police, which went to Dowie Evans, one the doctor, Dowie Evans, who could easily spot all the criminal things which had gone on, which so not coincidentally happened all to be in Lucy Letby's shifts. And there are many more, which I'm not naming here right now, but uh, I, uh, I have many correspondents who've pointed out so many interesting things for me. <laughs>